Joseph Smith's eighth plural wife was Mary Elizabeth Rollins Leitner. Mary was born on April 9th of 1818, about 20 miles from Palmyra, New York. Mary had an older brother and a younger sister, and her father died in a shipwreck when she was just two and a half years old. After his death, they moved in with the Gilbert family in Ohio. In 1830, the Rollins family began to hear rumors of the Book of Mormon. Mary was baptized in November of that year by Parley P. Pratt in a stream near the Isaac Morley farm. She was 12 years old at the time. Isaac Morley obtained one of the first copies of the Book of Mormon, and Mary asked to borrow it while he was at one of his meetings. She apparently hadn't read it before she got baptized, so Isaac allowed her to borrow it. She read all of 1 Nephi that night and memorized the first passage. When she returned it to Isaac the next morning, summarizing the entire first book and reciting the first verse verbatim, he said, child, take this book home and finish it. I can wait. In early February of 1831, Joseph Smith came and visited the Gilbert home where the Rollins were staying. He was surprised to see a copy of the Book of Mormon, which was still rare in Ohio. When he was told of Mary's enthusiasm for the book, he asked to meet her. Mary wrote, I was sent for. When he saw me, he looked at me so earnestly, I felt almost afraid. And I thought, he can read my every thought. And I thought how blue his eyes were. After a moment or two, he came to put his hands on my head and gave me a blessing. The first I ever received and made me a present of the book. It was during this time that Mary Elizabeth would later recall Joseph Smith had a private conversation with her, in which he told her of a great vision he had concerning her. According to her, Joseph Smith said that she was the first woman God commanded him to take as a plural wife. Child. When Mary Elizabeth was 13 years old, she had the gift of interpreting tongues. Mary Elizabeth was once called upon to interpret the glossolalia spoken by the brethren. Her interpretation predicted that the saints would be driven from Jackson County, Missouri by the mobs. Naturally, some of the brethren protested her interpretation, but Joseph answered that she was correct. She later said that while the interpretation of tongues belonged to the priesthood, they had not asked for it, and so it was put upon her shoulders. When she was 14, Mary Elizabeth worked for Peter Whitmer as a tailor, and she gained a reputation as a seamstress. When Lilliburn Boggs had been elected lieutenant governor, he hired Peter Whitmer to make a suit for his inauguration. So Mary Elizabeth went to Lilliburn Boggs' house to stitch the collars and the face of the coat. The Boggs family liked her so much that they tried to get her to leave the church, but she refused. Interestingly, in 1837, after Boggs became the governor, the state militia came to far west Missouri to drive out the Mormons. Boggs reportedly gave orders to spare only two families, the Clemensons and the Leitners. On July 20th of 1833, a mob attacked the office of the Evening and Morning Star, which was then printing the Book of Commandments. Mary and her sister Caroline were hiding, came out with pages of the book, and talked of destroying them. So while the mob was busy prying out the gable end of the house, the girls each ran and gathered an armful of the sheets. Although the men saw them and shouted at them to stop, Mary and Caroline darted away and hid in a large cornfield. The girls were not detected and brought the pages to the printer's wife, who was overjoyed to have them. In August of 1835, when Mary was just 17 years old, she married a non-Mormon named Adam Leitner, who was 25. The following year, Mary had her first child, Miles Henry. Her second child, Caroline, came in 1840. By Mary's own account, she had been having dreams of becoming Joseph Smith's wife. If anything, this would be evidence of his grooming her. In her own words, she says, I had been dreaming for a number of years I was his wife. I thought I was a great sinner. I prayed to God to take it from me. Joseph proposed to Mary Elizabeth in early February of 1842. She was eight months pregnant at the time. After Joseph taught Mary Elizabeth about polygamy, he told her that God had instructed him to marry her in 1834, but he had been in Kirtland and she had been in Missouri. In 1834, she was just 16 years old but I guess that's better than 12. Mary recalls Joseph saying, the angel came to me three times between the year 1834 and 42 and said I was to obey that principle or he would destroy me. Joseph said I was his before I came here and he said all the devils in hell should never get me from him. I was created for him before the foundation of the earth was laid. When Joseph told her these things, Mary recalls, no human being can tell my feelings on this occasion. My faith in him as a prophet about failed me. I could not sleep and scarcely eat. After Joseph told Mary of the angel's instruction to marry her, Mary asked why the Lord did not reveal the same thing to her. Joseph then promised her that she would have a witness. One night I retired to bed, but not to sleep, for my mind was troubled, so sleep fled from me. My Aunt Gilbert was sleeping with me at the time, when a great light appeared in the room. Thinking the kindling wood was on fire that was spread on the hearth, I rose up in bed to look, when, lo, when a person stood in front of the bed looking at me. Its clothes were whiter than anything I'd ever seen. I could look at its person. But when I saw its face, so bright and more beautiful than any earthly thing could be, and those eyes piercing me through and through, I could not endure it. It seemed as if I must die with fear. I fell back in bed and covered up my head, so as not to see it. I pushed Aunt very hard to have her look up and see it too, but I could not wake her, and I could not speak. I thought if she were awake, I would not feel so afraid. As it is, I could never forget that face. It seems to be ever before me. 
In another account, she gives different details. She says that the angel leaned over her, but she was so scared she didn't speak. She said her aunt did wake up and saw the angel pass through the window. And when she told Joseph of the experience, he called her a coward. She said she was weak, and Joseph reprimanded her for not calling out to the Lord. And then she asks, if it was an angel of light, why did he not speak to me? Joseph says, because you covered your face and the angel was insulted. Except in this version, she didn't cover her face and nor did she tell Joseph that she covered her face. And when she asked Joseph, will it ever come again? He said, no, not the same one. But if you are faithful, you shall see greater things than these. In February of 1842, Joseph and Mary Elizabeth went into the upper room of Joseph Smith's red brick store, the Masonic Hall, and the marriage was performed for time and all eternity. Mary Elizabeth was 23 years old and like I said, eight months pregnant. Her husband Adam was out of town and likely didn't know that this was happening. Later, Mary gave the reason why she stayed with her first husband. I did just as Joseph told me to do. Joseph also told Mary, I know that I shall be saved in the kingdom of God. I have the oath of God upon it, and God cannot lie. All that he gives me, I shall take with me, for I have that authority and power conferred upon me. In other words, by marrying him, Mary Elizabeth was guaranteed a place in the celestial kingdom. An interesting part of this story is that at one point, Adam got a job cutting cordwood 15 miles north of Nauvoo. And when Joseph learned that Mary would be moving, he was extremely distraught. With tears streaming down his cheeks, he prophesied that if we attempt to leave the church, we would have plenty of sorrow, for we would make property on the right hand and lose it on the left. We would have sickness on sickness and lose our children, and that I would have to work harder than I ever dreamed of. And at last, when you are worn out and almost ready to die, you will get back to the church. Before she left Nauvoo, Joseph baptized the Rollins and Leitner families again and tried hard to get Mr. Leitner to go into the water, but Adam said he did not feel worthy. Unfortunately, after they moved from Nauvoo, one of Mary's children did die, and only one person showed up to the funeral besides herself. And after the birth of her fourth child, her house was struck by lightning that caused everyone to pass out. The family suffered fever and chills, and in 1844, Joseph was killed at Carthage Jail. After this, Mary had a dream that an angel visited her and told her to move back to Nauvoo, which she did. After returning to Nauvoo, Mary received her endowment and joined the elite group of the Holy Order. And in the fall of 1844, Brigham Young proposed to her. She was sealed to him for time only. When the church left Nauvoo, Mary and Adam stayed behind. Brigham Young had asked her if she wanted to go west, and she had said yes. A few days later, however, Brigham just left without her. Mary wrote, I felt stunned. The thought came to me that polygamy was of the devil, and Brigham knew it or he would have cut off his right hand before he would have left me. I wept myself sick and felt to give up and go among the Gentiles. In fact, I felt as though I was like one in an open boat at sea without compass or rudder. Later, Brigham did send word to Mary, asking her to come and join the saints, but the Lightners were in poverty and had no means of getting to Utah. Apparently Brigham Young wasn't willing to pay for her to cross the plains. So Mary stayed with Adam and they continued to have children together and they continued to struggle financially and she lost a few more of her children. In 1863, the Lightners finally did make it to Salt Lake, and it looks like Brigham Young had promised her a house, but never actually followed through. Throughout the end of her life, she asked for financial assistance from church leaders. She asked John Taylor in 1881, and he gave her just over $16 a month. She also asked President Wilford Woodruff, who helped her pay off some debts, and gave her just over $16 a month. In 1903, she even asked Joseph F. Smith for financial help, because they had stopped sending her that money. Mary pointed out how much she was having to give back in tithing for the money they gave her. Joseph F. Smith allowed her to have that $16 a month. Mary later wrote, I do not feel recognized by the Smith family. She says, I feel as if I have been spiritually neglected. Heber C. Kimball once told Mary Elizabeth that she would see Joseph before she died. Sometime later, after Heber had died, Mary had a spiritual experience that she felt fulfilled this prophecy. Suddenly I saw, just outside the door, three men. They stood about two feet from the ground. These men were the prophet Joseph Smith, his brother Hiram, and Heber C. Kimball. Joseph stood in the middle with one arm around each of their shoulders. They were bowing and smiling at me. Now I was looking into those clear blue penetrating eyes. As I had done years ago when he had answered my many questions about the gospel, I looked around, pinched my arm to see if I was dreaming. As they were still smiling and bowing, I thought that I would shake hands with them. They saw my confusion and understood it and they laughed, and I thought Brother Kimball would kill himself laughing. I had no fear, trembling with joy. I arose, took a step forward and extended my hand. They began fading away as the going down of the sun. In total, Mary buried six of her ten children. Adam passed away in 1885. Mary outlived the first five presidents of the church, the first two of whom had been her husbands. In fact, she was the last of Joseph Smith's wives to die, and one of only four who lived into the 20th century. 